Barracoon's Computer World and Define Tomorrow. Um, I'm still here with Nick Dyer from Nimble Storage. Um, if you didn't see the first video, um, me and Nick have had a bit of a catch up as to where Nimble have been over the last 12 months. We're now kind of moving forward on to the, the latest firmware update from yep. Nimble Storage. We're going to see some of that in action. Mm -hmm. um, so Nick, maybe give us a little bit of background about the latest version of firmware. Which of those features that we may have spoke about is already included and, and what, what, what were you trying to achieve, I suppose, with the latest firmware release? Yeah, so um, every six to eight months or so, we do a new release of of Nimble OS, mm -hmm. uh, and we, we typically embed somewhere in the region of five to 10 features within that new code. Uh, th there's no charge to our customers as long as they have a support agreement, they get the code automatically. Um, and so Nimble OS 4 was released uh, roughly two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and it's released in what we, into what we call in initial production release. Uh, it's not firmly GA just yet. It hasn't met our, our burning code saturation for the field okay. uh, just yet. So this is only on whitelisted systems, but essentially the idea is that we've now seeded this out to our install base. They can start to use it, start to play around with some of the new features and see what they think. So typically, how long would you expect to see this going into production? I know you can't kind of commit to a time scale, yep. but typically yep. how long would it be? Um, so we normally expect to see this happen within one to two months. Okay. Um, GA code for Nimble essentially means it needs to meet uh, essentially a burn-in year criteria. I believe it's 150 years augment, uh, augmented across all of our install base okay. of the code without any, one P, any P1 bugs, mm -hmm. and also it needs to hit over five nines availability in the field for that code. Okay. So um, only when we actually meet that, that, that point does it actually then get made GA to all of our install base. And one of the things I find around Nimble Storage is obviously your controllers are sort of x 6 based hardware. Yep. Um, your, your software company, as you touched upon in the last video, you, you have hardware, but primarily you are a software company. Yeah. Each of your releases tends to not just be more reliable, more secure, and all the things that we expect from a firmware update from any hardware manufacturer. Yep. You get crucial functionality, you get improved user experience and things like that. Absolutely. So um, we've come a long way. I mean, I joined the company back in uh, November 2012, and when I joined the company, we were an iSCSI-only storage array, um, which really fit, I guess, the mid-market mid to the low end. And we've really seen all these features bolt on over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, but actually, we've taken our time with those features and really scoped out exactly how to deploy them, rather than just throw something at our install base and say that will probably do. And I think one of the places that was really kind of um, apparent was the Vivol integration. Yeah. The luxury of your platform allowed you to run a lot of that code or all of that code actually on your controllers, yes. whereas some of the other providers had to roll out additional virtual machines to help implement the Vivol technology. Vivol technology being the next generation of the way to implement storage for a VMware platform. Absolutely. So. Um, we knew that VVOLS was going to be a complete game changer for the industry. Um, so we believed that we really wanted to engineer the best of breed technology for, for virtual volumes. We wanted to be known as the best storage technology to run virtual volumes yeah. with. Um, so what we decided to do was make all of the every, everything that we wanted to do was to be embedded within Nimble OS. Mm -hmm. If we embed it within Nimble OS inside the controllers, then we don't force our customers to run and spin up multiple different types of VM. They don't have to maintain them. And also, the challenge with that is if something goes wrong with that VM, you break your integration. Yeah. If we run it natively within Nimble OS, we can drive the HA and the availability that we want to get from it. But also, if we need to upgrade it for any reason, it's just as simple as a Nimble OS upgrade. So, version four is your latest version. Yep. As you say, um, sort of out now but not ready for, for general release. Yep. Um, what If I had to limit you to five new features, what, yep. what are the five new features that you'd kind of want to be talking to a customer about? So the, the very first thing that you'll see on the screen is uh, we've just released a, a new user interface. Okay. So um, historically our user interface was, was Flash based. Okay. Uh, when we first came out in 2010, Flash wasn't the dirty word that it is today mm -hmm. with all the security flaws. Um, so we knew that we had to engineer a new, uh, a new GUI, but we wanted to make it very similar to how InfoSight looked. Yep. So we wanted to use uh, a Web 2.0 interface, mm -hmm. so we're using HTML5, we're using very, very cool applets to do so, but we wanted to unify it with how InfoSight looked and filled as well. So um, if, you, if you look on the screen now, yep. you can see that I've got the new user interface up, um, and it's, 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 the great thing is it's a lot more responsive. Sure. So like, I can start to see straight away when I log into my home page, I can see exactly how InfoSight looks. Uh, I can see space usage of where we believe volumes are going to be in the future. Are they, are they full up or are they trending to be full? Or are they over the thresholds that customers have set? Mm -hmm. The challenge with thin provisioning, of course, is people can now over provision a whole storage array. So we want to give them warnings yep. of that. But also we want to trend when they may be out of capacity in the future. Okay. So rather than just giving you, hey, you're out of capacity, we want to tell you when you may be out of capacity in the future as well. And, and, and this, this front screen is, is all about really having a, a good dashboard. I mean, yeah. realistically, the majority of people that probably 
probably using them will don't want to spend a lot of time in the user interface. Absolutely. Um, they want something that they can go into, quickly check what's going on from a single point of view. So on that view, it looks like you've got alarms over on the right hand side. You've got yep. what's happened recently on the array. You've got your performance. You've got your space. Yep. And you've got prote protection. So it's, it's yep. kind of that, that one stop shop just to have a quick look what's going on with Nimble. Absolutely. So you don't have to go anywhere for this. You can just eyeball this straight away and you can see what's here. And you can just roll your mouse over things and you can see what percentage of, of volumes are being replicated, what aren't, what are locally snapshotted, what are, what's lagging from a replication point of view, um, what errors you may have on your system, uh, and what software upgrade you need to do on your array, we'll okay. flag it here. And also space usage, how much space you're using, uh, and also then what space you're seeing, seeing through data reduction, such as cloning, deduplication, and compression as well. Sure. Uh, and yes, you can you can flip between uh, IOPS and latency and, and megabytes per second throughput as well. Um, the, the a lot of the layout from from what we did from a technology point of view is very similar to how we had it before, um, in the way that we actually manage data. So this is one of our our, our demo systems within the UK, uh, and we've still got the same layout that we had before. It's just a lot quicker, a lot snappier, and I can edit things and change things around. We also uh, released uh, the folder integration. So uh -huh. folders is not a concept that's been that, that, that's, that's new. It's been around for a very long time. It's a way to organize and keep things together. Maybe certain applications together. Maybe certain things such as your disaster recovery requirements. Okay. We use folders in a way uh, to present virtual volume data stores. Okay. So in the Nimble world, a folder essentially is a VVOL data store. Mm -hmm. uh, and inside of that, you can see here, I've got all of my VMDKs, my virtual volumes, okay. with my swap files and with my config volumes. And you can see what application profile they're on as well. And also how much performance I'm using, what the latency is. So I can start to give indications as to what my VVOL requirements are sure. and where issues may be lying. Um, and uh, one of the big features that we launched within Nimble OS 4 is uh, this uh, quality of service for manual tuning. Okay. So in three, we had automated quality of service, um, which was really to, to really help you out at a point in contention. Yeah. Now, we had a lot of requirements for enterprise customers who wanted to essentially throttle back certain requirements on a storage array, but also our cloud service providers mm -hmm. who want to offer multi-tenancy environments. They had a requirement where they wanted to be able to offer SLAs for different yeah. performance levels. So in the, in the UI now, we can set this on a volume or a folder level. And a folder now could be a construct of a customer okay. be in, a, in a managed service provider. And I can now set limits of throughput and or IOPS. Mm -hmm. So I can set those requirements and I can see what I'm doing over the last 24 hours. And I can set those limits of IOPS or throughput. And that's an instantaneous change. Mm -hmm. So if I see something that's absolutely sl slamming on my array that it shouldn't be, like a, a SQL DBA doing a test volume, I can go in, quasim down, and that's an instantaneous change that will happen on the system. And on I, think, the I think that is important. When you have a bucket of performance, yeah. um, you want to be able to use that for a, a number of different tasks. And obviously, while you don't have contention, it's great just letting and get on with it. But realistically, if you are doing test and dev, if you are doing development, <laughs> there will be at some point where the application consume more than actually the business would like it to, yep. and it may have a detrimental effect on the production uh, environment. So it's nice, as you say, that you had the automated before for points of contention, <coughs> but this we can, can guarantee it, and I can really see that use case, as you say, for um, managed service providers, for cloud yes. providers, where I purchase a certain amount of IOPS. Mm -hmm. I suppose I want to know as the customer that I'm going to get those IOPS and someone else isn't going to be consuming them. Um, and second of all, the, the provider wants to know that I'm limited to what I've paid for. Absolutely. And, you, and this is a, a building block for our cloud volumes yep. technology. So in cloud volumes, you can actually um, change the IOPS requirement of your cloud volume, and it will essentially just automatically change the quas on the on the on the back end volume to increase. And I, I saw a demonstration of that on the storage field day mm -hmm. stuff. So go head over to storagefieldday.com, I think it is, to see yes. that demo. But it, it was on and off as quickly as that. They <coughs> yeah. were running an application that was consuming as much performance as possible. They tweaked it, and bang, it went straight up, and they got that more performance. So I have a customer um, that essentially is an engineering house, mm -hmm. and they offer VMs out to it to their to their engineering teams. Um, the, the, the appeal of IOPS limits and also cloud volumes, essentially is he can change the dial of performance on a volume all the way up to when he knows an application is going to break. Okay. So he can essentially allow his developers to keep on testing with mm -hmm. their code, and he can change the dial on the fly, mm -hmm. and he can keep on increasing and seeing where the flux or the break is in their code that they can then go and re-engineer. Uh, I suppose you could also do that when you're putting workloads from test into production. Mm -hmm. um, you may have a requirement for it to be as performant as possible, in which case you might not put anything on it, but equally it may be 
consuming more than you would want it to. So yes. you might want to see actually where is the point where I'm able to reduce those IOPS, but I'm still able to get that report out of the system within two hours or overnight or whatever that would be and kind of get that balance correct. So it's Absolutely. nice to have the option to do that fine tuning where, where you need to be able to do it. Yeah, and, um, and the real thing that I like about this, which is really nice, is you can do IOPS and or megabytes per second. Okay. So you may have an application which is really, really random intensive workload big random writes and, and random reads, you need to guarantee all the IOPS that you want for that. Mm. However, every now and again, there's this really horrible sequential workload in yeah. the middle of the day, and you don't really care about that because it's just a back-end operation. Sure. So I can uh, essentially quads down the megabyte per second throughput to essentially throttle that sequential workload, whilst at the same time allowing it to have all of its random workload with its IOPS requirements. Okay. And I really like that feature. Yeah, definitely. So that's one of the things that's rolled into four. That's yep. for both the all flash array and for the hybrid array. Okay. So it's the same nimble OS for both systems. Yep. The, the firmware, the, the file system is slightly different for both arrays. It is a purpose built all flash array file system, yep. but the software features are exactly the same. So we don't develop one yep. against the other. Um, the only difference with that was is D-Loop, and D-Loop on hybrid is coming out later on this year. So, so we said top five features. We've got HTML5 interface, yep. and we have manual um, quality of service. That's right, yeah. Um, we've also we, uh, just released Hyper-V integration. So okay. one of the big things that we, we worked on very early at Nimble was something called Nimble Protection Manager, okay. which again is built into Nimble OS. It runs on the controller, and it's integrated uh, data protection. So it's integrated data protection for snapshots and replication, but also application-aware integration for in, 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 in with SQL, Exchange, and VMware. Okay. Now, in Europe especially, we've seen a big uptake in Hyper-V. Mm -hmm. Not so much in the States, but in, in Europe, it's a, it's a real, real big install base. So we were having lots of customers ask about Hyper-V snapshot integration, mm -hmm. not for just the Hyper-V server, but for Hyper-V virtual machines inside. Okay. That's quite complex, yeah. because you, also, you, ha you now have multiple VSS integrations that you have to build. Sure. So um, we now have Hyper-V uh, native VSS integration capabilities for snapshot, clone, and replicate for application aware for the virtual machine layer within Hyper-V. Nice. That's something that we've been asking for for a while. Big tick in the box if, if you're Hyper-V house, it's Absolutely. nice to see that kind of um, relevant, um, you can now be compared to the VMware platform that, that you've been given before. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I believe if we were to go into here, you can see here that we actually have, uh, in the data protection, we've actually got a volume collection configured with Hyper-V. And if I was just to go in and take a look at that, what does it look like? Well, it's just got Hyper Microsoft VSS uh, synchronization integrated into Hyper-V. Uh, and you can see the application here and the server name okay. that it is. But it's a lot more complex than that yeah, because yeah. it will talk to the Hyper-V agents within Hyper-V, the VSS agents within mm -hmm. Hyper-V. But also then it will go into each individual virtual machine and talk into their VSS agents. And it's a three-way quiescing and coalescing. Okay. So um, it's not the simplest feature, but absolutely it's now part of Nimble OS 4. Fantastic. And the final feature is um, we, we see a lot of our customers doing a lot of things with PowerShell. Mm -hmm. um, and especially with 2012 and 2016, PowerShell is absolutely mm -hmm. the way forward. And when you want to do things such as database restores, um, mounting uh, a snapshot or a clone and getting the data, re data drive resignatures through disk part, removing the flags from it, getting up to the database layers is a series of steps. Mm -hmm. It's a bit complex. So we've built native integration now within, within our Windows Toolkit to now do that workflow for you. Okay. So a customer now can call one Power, Power CLI or PowerShell um, script, mm -hmm. and we will do the entire mount point, reflagging, um, disparting, and presenting all the way up to the database. Okay. I can restore tables, databases, rows, and columns okay. natively within SQL using the native integration okay. within Nimble. Well, that's quite powerful then, because I mean, uh, everyone talks about kind of DevOps, whether you, that is relevant to you or not, uh, being able to automate certain certain tasks that you do regularly, or maybe it isn't that, maybe it is just simplifying a task that you yep. may have to do every now and then can be really important. And I think whilst maybe kind of the out and out DevOps people are looking at raw APIs that they're looking to be using, I think your average Joe, IT administrator, me, yep. PowerShell is a lot more friendly, a lot more accessible, and, and a, a good kind of first step to go down that automation journey. I would agree. So we've also built the same integration with, within PowerCLI yep. and our REST API as well. Okay. So we see the we see the way forward in that side of in that side of the house, and just really going on the DevOps uh, side of, of kind of what we're doing in Nimble. Mm -hmm. Nimble OS 4 also built in new application integration, 
which isn't necessarily tied to the firmware, okay. but it's something that we've packaged in Nimble OS. Sure. So we release native Docker integration. Okay. So you've now got native Docker integration, um, and it's available on the Docker store, mm -hmm. so people can just go and download from Docker natively, so Docker Nimble Storage, yeah. and it will download the plugin. So we can now present consistent, um, a persistent storage directed to Docker VMs, or okay. Docker containers, I should say. Um, and we've just announced our integration with Docker for Windows. Okay, fantastic. That is going to be a big feature, mm. I think, that's going to happen this year. Um, and the other integration that we launched with was native Oracle Linux integration. Okay. So all of this stuff I've just talked about with SQL, we can also do with Oracle on Linux, yeah. uh, where we can give Oracle DBAs and power to actually do snapshot, clone, replicate, and restore mm -hmm. natively with an Oracle with Nimble framework and technologies. Okay. So there's no scripting to do, there's no Nimble side of the house to do, it's all natively presented up to, uh, up to Oracle. So I suppose um, a question on that from, from my side out of general interest really, um, obviously Nick you generally work in the UK market, yeah. what adoption are you seeing from containers and Docker at the moment? Who is it? Is it really only development firms? Because I mean undoubtedly it's going to, it's growing, mm -hmm. it's going to become more common and more use, um, a more common use case. Yeah. But when is that? And I think going to speaking to the vendors, you guys probably start to see it first before the resellers like myself, mm -hmm. and then before the customers. So I'd be interested to know your kind of thoughts as to actually what you're seeing in the field today. So um, Docker is uh, and containers, I guess, as as, as more of a, an industry is mm -hmm. certainly accelerating. Mm -hmm. It's mostly been in the DevOps side of the house and the engineering side of the house because it allows them to really you know reduce their time to market and reduce their time to engineering builds. Um, I think what you're going to start to see in the next year to 18 months is once Docker for Windows comes out, Docker Data Center and Docker Swarm, all of that kind of, I guess, the appeal to the, the standard, uh, you know, admin, mm -hmm. guys like me and you, um, are really going to see the way forward with that. Mm -hmm. So I would say in the next 18 months or so, we're going to see a huge up uptake in customers just moving virtual machines to containerized platforms. Uh -huh. Not because they're, they're DevOps or not because they want to kind of get that time to market, because actually it saves on licensing costs. Yeah. It, saves, it saves on deployment times and it's easy to run and it's easier to manage. I, I suppose if, if the software vendors start distributing applications in that way, yeah. it, it's easy to do. And I suppose with things like vSphere integrated containers, yeah. that, that adoption can be even easier than having to go out and look at another platform, Absolutely. such as Docker or whatever it is, to, to, um, uh, to run those containers. Containers. Yeah, so um, so with with VMware leading the charge on this, I, I think you'll you'll see a huge adoption of this in in, in the very near future. Definitely. So um, we see that we understand that. So we're actually developing a lot of platforms natively within this containerized infrastructure because we see that as the uh, essentially as the next wave after virtualization. Well, that's great. Thank you ever so much, Nick. Uh, really good to to see the new refresh platform and learn a little bit more about the version four firmware. Um, look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank Perfect. you. Thanks, Barry.